Omi Adekunle. Wade Phillips. <laughs> it has no Wade Phillips, no color in it, no juice. But Yomi, you know, uh, uh, we was getting a biscuit where? Hardee's. Hardee's. And they're, you know, they're kind of fascinated with Yomi. They're, they love that name. There was one lady commented on it. But then this other lady says, um, you're from Nigeria? I wonder if you might know Danny Schroeder. <laughs> and Yomi goes, no. <laughs> There's 200 million people in Nigeria. <laughs> 200 million people. <laughs> oh, that's, that's hilarious. <laughs> He said, I don't think so. <laughs> oh, I, had, I had a ball over that one. <clears throat> the word mystery is not in the Old, uh, in, in the old Testament. <clears throat> and the principle of, the, of what mystery means <clears throat> is not in the Old Testament. But it's a word that's commonly used in the New Testament. <clears throat> at mysterion. Uh, but, but an equivalent word to that in its meaning is not in the Old Testament. So I say that to say the word secret is in the Old Testament quite prolifically. The word secret and God reveals his secrets to his servants. And he reveals his secrets to the church, to his people. And he reveals his secrets to his prophets. <clears throat> so the idea of revelation is in the Old Testament. And uh, even the word reveal. Uh, so what is the definition of a mystery? It is a revelation or a secret that has become known. And that kind of explains uh, the Old Testament in contrast with the New. That under the terms of the New Covenant and the experience and power of it, mainly that the Holy Spirit can now dwell in you, and you have a quickened mind and a quickened spirit under the New Covenant in Christ, so that now you can comprehend uh, the revelation of God that was real in the, revealed in the Old Testament. So that kind of comes, about, uh, you know, the old saying, or it's a common saying, uh, that the uh, New Testament was hidden in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. So that makes it uh, a, a radical difference. Yet, our covenant is right. Will you sincerely, in the presence of God and these witnesses, take this Bible, all of it? Am I okay? Uh, you take this Bible as the Word of God, all of it. Like the Lord says to John, eat all of it. And, and some, some of the other prophets. Uh, and man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that doth proceed out of the mouth of God. Um, and so we are commissioned in, in, in the New Testament. The church is commissioned to go in all the world and preach the gospel. And Matthew says this gospel, this gospel, the one that Zion assembly is enlightened to this gospel. And uh, there's a lot of people involved in missionary work, but they're, they don't, they're not carrying the whole message, and some of them not the true message. I mean, in our former fellowship, it came up more than one time. Uh, they said, Brother Phyllis, we don't feel like you're with us now. 
I said, well, in a lot of ways, I'm not. And they said, well, one time, <laughs> one of the brethren there said, we don't feel like you want us to succeed in our missionary work. I said, yeah, I don't. I don't want you going around the world telling everybody you have somebody else's wife or husband. I don't want you going around the world misrepresent what repentance is and sanctification is. No, I don't want you to succeed. And if he'd asked the Apostle Paul that, he would have said, no, I, w I want your whole work to burn down. Isn't that what he said? That if you build upon this foundation, wood, hay, and stubble, it will burn up. What's happened with us with our former fellowship in the last 20 years? It's burning up. All the wood, hay, and stubble is burning up. And that's what purified it through Zion Assembly. And so I'm not, I'm not glorying in Zion Assembly beyond what I should because we stand by faith in Zion Assembly. <coughs> and we, it's up to us to keep the faith. Because remember, we're still just betrothed to the Lord. We're not married yet. And if you don't remain uh, faithful during your betrothal till he returns and receives you until him, to himself, that's marriage talk. I'm going away. I'm going to prepare a place for you in my father's house. I'll come again and receive you unto myself. It's sort of like Paul talking about winning Christ. That's marriage talk. You win your wife, you win your husband. And he talks about winning Christ as a companion, eternally as a companion. And Jesus feels the same way you do. Well, uh, he wants to make sure that you're going to remain faithful. So it's a fearful thing to stand at the altar. Say, you, you think the church is formed by a covenant? Well, I, I tell them usually, well, you must. You're still marrying people. That's, that's the, as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. Isaiah 66, excuse me, 62 and 5. As a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. Brother Burnett tells his children, he said, even when you're right there at the altar and you're ready to say, I do, if something comes up and you're not sure, I'll come and get you right there. <laughs> I believe he would. I'm not even sure if the, if the son or the daughter is trying to get married. He's not <laughs> pulling away. <laughs> no, I want to try it. <laughs> no, because how serious, how serious it is. And how sober thinking it is about getting married. And so being a member of the church is that way. But you have to have a vision, we say that, an understanding of the church before it really has any deep meaning to you. <coughs> if you don't see the church uh, as the scripture presents it, as something sacred and holy and special and peculiar to God, and uh, where God uh, it becomes a dreadful place to interpret God's word, to be the pillar and ground of the truth. Uh, then the, you, you'll never take seriously the idea of church. And the world doesn't have the vision, and they don't. They think you can go over here and have a prayer meeting, and that's a church. Or you can go over here and have a singing convention, that makes a church. Uh, no, the church is uh, so much more than that. Not even something like baptism can make a church. Because baptism has no explanation of things that you believe in and a commitment for you to live by these standards. Baptism doesn't do that. We, you, you know, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and you come up, and that's it. So I guess you might come up with believing in the Trinity, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But uh, you have to have an understanding, not only with you with God, but you all with one another. And so this covenant, the mystery of the covenant, 
And it's God that has ordained that that mystery. Now, when, when does he say, and the two shall be one flesh? And he makes of the two. He makes of the two one flesh. And it's the moment you make that covenant commitment. And uh, you can even be married without, in some extreme cases, just to make the point, you can even be married and not capable of the conjugational act. People have got married on that basis because marriage is so much more than just reproduction. It's, it's uh, the Catholic Church says that the only, the only legitimate reason for a man and woman to come together in conjugation. Am I saying that right, conjugation? No. The conjugal act. I know it's conjugal. Sex. <laughs> Sex act. I, I felt liberty in that. <laughs> Let's see, we don't have any children in here. <laughs> Isabel. <laughs> Isabel is going. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> they say that that's the only legitimate reason it, to think about reproduction. But it's not. In the Bible, it's not anywhere. The husband, the Old Testament goes that, that, if you just got married and the Israel went off to war, the married couple, the guy didn't have to go. And what's it say? We're going to let you stay home for a year to cheer up your wife. And so you cheer one another up because it's a natural thing. And uh, some of you are uncomfortable with me talking like this. I know what you mean. I feel it too. <laughs> but that's... Uh, that's just the Bible. So uh, the point is most, most churches have interpreted the marriage is not sealed until you go to bed. In fact, uh, to speak more graphically about it, uh, in order for the marriage to be having to be really realized and believe that it's consummated, the guy had to hold up a sheet with blood on it because that was to prove, so-called, prove her virginity. <coughs> so it went that far. Well, we don't get into all that. That's, that's because that's not what we, the, what we believe the Bible teaches. It's a covenant union, and you make it all while you stand there with conditions for better or for worse. Of course, uh, along the way, many marriages, the conjugal act has been interrupted because an accident has erased the possibility of it. So, but are you still married by the covenant? Absolutely. And do you still owe each other? The, when the Bible says defraud not one another except to be for consent for a time, that means that you're obligated to each other in regard to the, the conjugal act. But where there's places where that's not possible, and so marriage is more than that. It's that kind of commitment. Um, and so the par but Paul says, in regard to everything I'm saying, uh, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. We're flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone. That's what Adam and Eve, Adam a type of Christ, Eve a type of the church, um, which the Bible plainly teaches. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 and 3. <clears throat> so I, I see some wondering about things. I just obviated several questions, apparently. Is there any questions up to this point right now? Anything that need clarified want me to get off the subject <laughs> I'm not 
Um, so your flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So when does that union that God honors because he determined uh, it, the basis of it, the covenant, uh, it happens at the moment you say, I do, I will. And if you look at the covenant, what made the church the church in the beginning, let's, re let's look at it. Acts 19, <laughs> verses 5 through 8. Hurry. Somebody really good that can open scripture. Hurry up so we won't lose any time. Exodus 19. <laughs> Exodus. I did. Yeah. It's on video. Yeah. <laughs> we'll turn to Acts 19, 5 and 8. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Exodus 19, 5 through 8. And this theme is carried all the way through. Hold on, okay, that's good. If you take this covenant, then you shall be my special treasure or my peculiar people. What's peculiar mean? It's not what we've developed it to mean, like, like Brother Dale, he's, he's peculiar. <laughs> yeah. Or Harris, you know, he's peculiar, <laughs> meaning weird. So it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that. It means uh, possession, <coughs> that it's the only one. So <coughs> your wife is peculiar to you in, in that she's the only one. And um, the c what makes that? The covenant, the commitment for better or for worse, and everybody still uses this, even the people don't mean it. <coughs> They're all still using it out there. People that think you can have nine wives, nine husbands. I mean, I'm talking about religious institutions now teaching that prolifically, commonly, boldly, because the church means nothing anymore to them because marriage means nothing to them anymore. And it's, it's, it's a mockery today. People get married for one week. Comes out on movie stars. And it's not, they just make the news. There's others doing it everywhere. Uh, get married for one week. Get married for three weeks. And uh, when they just stood there before the preacher and he administered for better or for worse in sickness <coughs> and in health, for richer or poorer, or if you're from West Virginia, poor, <laughs> which is <laughs> it's where I'm from. Uh, do you really mean that? Till death? They all still say that, and they don't mean it. When people ask me about our standard on marriage, and... Uh, they, they usually ask that question, um, that you don't believe in divorce and remarriage. I said, you didn't believe it either. Uh, because, you know, when you take the covenant, that's what you say. And it's interesting that almost everybody out there is still using that old covenant marriage language. The standard that we believe in. It's just that we take it seriously. And we embodied it as a, as a doctrine, as a teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ and God Almighty. That's how we have to live by it. And so I, I have said plainly, uh, for the glory of God and for the benefit of people who are contemplating marriage to, and to make others understand what marriage is, my wife and I, struggled the first three years of our marriage you know because Dale was so mean <laughs> but we had 
we, we just neither one knew how to be married. And I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I come from a broken home. Mother married five times. And, uh, you know, the whole thing, what do you call that? Uh, dysfunctional. I'm dysfunctional. <laughs> come from a dysfunctional family. Uh, well, you might, you may be, but the whole world's open to you. Salvation's open to you. Living right and the blessings of God upon your life is open to you. So you can play the victim part all you want. The reason I'm this way is because it's Freudian psychology everywhere. The reason I'm this way is my mommy and my daddy. Uh, could, you, could you see how that made me angry? We don't play the victim card over anything because you can become anything you, God wants you to be and anything that would make you happy and have peace and all that's involved in salvation. It's for you if you want it. You walk off from it. Not your mommy walked off from it. Not your daddy walked off from it. You walk off from it. You stand there on your own two feet as a, as a person created in God's image. And it's up to you. And you can make out of life what uh, the, the most of it by the help of the Lord Jesus Christ and salvation. But you have to be restored uh, into his perfect image. <coughs> so back to the covenant. Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 through 8. Uh, we've got, did you finish reading that? Okay. Okay, that's good. And all that the Lord hath commanded us. They made a covenant not only with the Lord, but with one another. It, we, we, all that the com Lord has commanded us, we will do. And so what's in that uh, revelation there is not only the covenant, but what the covenant implies that you, you're, you spell out the will of God, and then you get a commitment after spelling out the, the will of God in doctrines of, of the government, doctrine, and discipline of the church. You spell it out, just like Moses come down off the mountain, gave him a law. And this same language is used again in chapter 24, verses 6 through 8, after Moses had actually given them the law. And they agreed to it. That's what a covenant is, an, a, a sacred, holy agreement. And here, it's not unilateral. It's mutual. The covenant with Abraham was unilateral. The covenant of faith, the covenant of salvation through Abraham was uh, unilateral. What I mean by that is, uh, when he got ready to cut the covenant with Abraham, which was the tradition... Uh, in the Old Testament, you cut a covenant, you take the animal sacrifice, you split it down the middle, and you put in the symmetry of an animal or a person. You cut Brother Dale right down the middle. You got one arm, one half of them over here, one rib cage over here, one leg over here, one arm over here. So it's a symmetry cut right down the middle. And then the two would uh, put blood on it as they walk through uh, the animal. And that's what they was getting ready to do, and God did something. He put Abraham to sleep. Abraham did not walk with him through it. God walked through it by himself because it was a covenant he was making in view of the Son of God who hang on the cross alone. That's not a mutual covenant. But now this covenant is mutual. What makes the church? The church is a mutual covenant. And uh, 
So this brother told me uh, in our former fellowship when we were all coming to loggerheads and he quit believing in the covenant. He said, uh, you believe in that old church covenant? He said, the covenant, brother, is the Old Testament and the New Testament. That's the covenant. He said, you're, you're trying to make almost like you take a covenant to keep the covenant. <laughs> That's what, he, that's what he did. I said, bingo, you finally see it. It is a covenant to keep the covenant. Somebody get 2 Kings chapter 23. Yeah, you can't understand this because it's hidden in a mystery. Uh, in marriage and in church. I think that's right. Verses 1 through 3. Read it, Brother David. Okay, let me explain to you what's happening here. The Bible had been lost in the temple. What a place for the Bible to be lost in the church. Been lost for a long time till they forgot about the old, you know, it was the old covenant the Old Testament. They had forgotten about it. And we're going to find out, among other things, how the Old Testament has glorious power yet. But <clears throat> Hilkiah had found the Bible and brought it to Josiah, the king. And this brought about a tremendous revival. And when the moment you start preaching and reading the Bible, conviction comes. Because the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing the dividing asunder. Piercing the spirit. Dividing asunder the soul and the spirit. And of the joints and the marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God is. So this is what's happening. So then what do they do? Okay, so all the words, read all the words of the Old Covenant, I mean the Old Testament. And uh, so that took some time, but because it was precious, every word of God is precious. People today don't even, uh, I'm just going to preach along with this today. People today are not taking the Bible seriously. Most Christians are biblically illiterate. They don't even know the Bible. And those who use some scriptures, all they do is have a few hobby horse scriptures, uh, especially those that talk about money so you can get money. And, and the whole Bible just lays there unused. And so what people are doing is manipulating God and his word to get what they want. But we take the Bible as... Uh, coming from the inspiration of God, and all of it is good for doctrine, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, for reproof, for discipline, for enlightenment, for everything. The word of God is precious, every word of it, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So what I want you to see here as he reads it, they're getting ready to make a covenant to keep the covenant. And that's what a church is. And he knew that. There was no way to unite Israel the people of God together unless it was by a covenant. And the old covenant couldn't do it by itself. You had to have a commitment there, a covenant to keep the covenant. Go ahead. So that's what happens. And all the people stood for the covenant. And so there you go, a perfect example of what the church covenant is and how important it is. It's a mutual, it's a mutual, I'm on a roll right now. It's a mutual covenant. <laughs> now, go ahead. Yeah, yeah it's, it means stood to the covenant, agreed to it. 
they joined to the covenant. They were in, implicated in making the covenant. Yeah, that's good. And I like the word join, not necessarily in this context by itself, but you join the church. You believe you, like West Virginia guy said, you believe you join a church. So after you figure out what a giant is, I, after we work through that, I, I said, yes, we do. Remind me of uh, taking a Greek course one time a year, hundred years ago. And, uh, you know, when I was a child, you could look out the window and dinosaurs were grazing out there. That's how I feel. <clears throat> and so this guy said, the, the professor was Dr. Gauss. He said, Dr. Gauss, I'm having a hard time with this Greek. He said, your problem's English. He said, if, go learn English and come back and take the Greek course. Jine, jine the church. Okay, this principle is everywhere. And the principle that uh, the church is married to God is everywhere in the Old Testament. The bride language, the bridal image, the bridal uh, marriage motif is all through the Old Testament. And it comes over even with more illumination in the New Testament. <coughs> so... That puts the idea of the church with God in a sacred posture. And in order to have that, it has to have a sacred beginning, a profound sacred beginning. When I was overseer of, um, I'll keep it anonymous right now. But people, when I got there, they weren't thinking about marriage well enough for me or deep enough. When they got married, y you know, the whole culture is bebop culture. So when they got married, they come down the aisle like this. And, and they had music going with it. And uh, say, does that matter, Brother Phil? Well, I think it does in that context because I knew what that meant. You know, you got to get rid of that jive turkey stuff for a minute. Uh, because you have to stand there soberly. And to make that commitment. And usually if you're mocking marriage about the, the covenant language, uh, I know we're accepting in some places if you jump over a stick, uh, that in their culture that's what a marriage means. But in those cultures, uh, marriage is very weak. One of the biggest problems in all of Africa is polygamy. And... Uh, I mean, you can have four or five wives. And the Christian churches that's doing missionary work over there are taking in uh, the polygamist and all of his wives together into the church, into the, their denomination. Well, we're uh, cleaning up the understanding of all that. So any questions about this? Marriage is a very sacred thing. You say, till death do us part. Yes. Well, my dad was a pastor <coughs> in Jamaica, so the BFC, I believe it, is that if you want to meet somebody from a different faith, you have to be walking in love. If you were in a church, how do you guide them to that faith? Well, you, know, you, you, have to, you have to love them. You, ha you have to love them patiently talk to them and tell them how precious they are and how good the Lord is and and that uh, we all experience salvation the same way then you start telling them what a marriage is what does he do after he's already signed this covenant he goes to them and says oh you mean you mean uh, the newcomer to the church yeah and they get saved and they tell him you know you have to choose life yeah Oh, what, what we always do, that, that's what we practice all along. So, um, 
dependent on little differences here because of each experience is a little different. But I usually say, I need to talk to you. Um, let's set aside some time. You don't take them into church, never. Never take them into church. You mean like sitting? Yeah. Well, that's the only way you take a person in church. You, you, you make a covenant to come into the co church. So the way we've practiced it for 100 years is, is um, you, you tell the person what marriage is and that the first companion is till death. You can't go say, will you take for what better for worse, sickness and health? Yes, I do. And three weeks later, get you another one say, will you take the covenant? And uh, this person, for better or for worse, in s till death do us part. Yes, I will. A month later. We, you get another one, you get rid of them because you broke that covenant, violated it. You, you really can't break the marriage covenant. You can violate it, but you can't break it. Oh, well, he probably has some moral obligation to that one. They need to understand that they had broken God's law, that that's not a Christian teaching. And you, you still have, if you got complicated, especially if there were children involved with the second marriage and all that goes with it, uh, you, you might, you'll have moral obligation to it, but not a divine spiritual obligation. In fact, you have a spiritual obligation not to remain married to that person. It's ungodly. It's paganistic to have two wives or two husbands at the same time. I mean, that is total confusion. That's Babylon. And so that's why we're here. That's what God's raised up Zion Assembly um, to do, to teach, uh, teach this is better. Yeah. And it's, quite frankly, difficult for me to sit there and, and, and hear that and listen to that. But, uh, again, I think you're referring back to this because this one came down from God anyway. Hmm. Uh, that's what I come up on. And, uh, Do you attend, you attend where Brother Carter is? No. Oh. No, I'm not going to stop there. I, I was hoping you did. I wanted to, I was going to talk to him. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I you know, you know, uh, I know where you are. Yeah. So attitude of church, such as did this church. Now, you know, I've always, you know, that sounds all almost like, you know, you, you get saved and you, you become part of the church. Such as did this church. The folks that went to this church. Can you help me with that a little bit? Attitude of church. Now, I agree with what you're saying. But oh, I'll, 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 I'll be glad to explain it. Yeah, well, first of all, let me give you one thing to think about in Greek. This is just one thing to think about. It, and it may be uh, church might be in there. To, uh, the meaning might mean church there, but ecclesia is not the word. That's an, an imposition of the King James Bible. It doesn't say church. Um, that's the first thing I'll say about it, but we'll talk more about it. What's your translation say? Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. That's it. Added to their number. So first of all, you, strictly speaking, you could you could um, argue that the 
the church is not even mentioned to Acts chapter 5. But let's say it does mean the church. It doesn't mean personally. God has never married anybody since Adam and Eve. God has never married anybody since Adam and Eve. He took Adam and Eve and brought them together, and God performed that wedding. He's never done it again since then uh, because he then turns it over to us to do everything. God never built the tabernacle. It says that, but what is the implication of that language? God did not build the temple. God doesn't do hardly anything now but commissions his church to do it. So you can be added to the Lord, be saved, but not have taken a covenant because it hadn't even been ministered to you yet because people have to do that. And so we honor that in that way. And it's sort of like um, uh, there's many other. Let me give you an example. God designed the tabernacle. God conceived of the tabernacle. But Moses and the people build it. And same way with the church. Uh, Paul and the apostles laid the foundation. And ever since then, everybody even builds on that foundation. Not God. He helps you to do it. So if any man build upon this foundation, wood, hay, and stubble, if any man build upon it, Take heed how you build the church of God. So we build the church. We do that, not God. So that scripture is like that. I say, and this is what I use to explain that in, in, the, in the language. I say, and you would say, uh, well, we're building a new house. Are you? Yeah. We decide to build a new house. That does not mean for one minute that you're actually doing the work of doing that. It means, God, it means you conceived it. You may have drawn up the plans for it. You're the one that wants it. You're the one that's going to pay for it, but you don't do the building. And so that's how I explain that. Pentecostalism? Pentecostalism. Um, we really don't call ourselves that, but we close, Zion Assembly Church of God. Short <laughs> Zion Assembly. <laughs> Zion Assembly. Okay. Shorter than that, Zion. <laughs> Shorter than that, Z. <laughs> <laughs> Not if he's remarried. If he divorced. No, no, no. Polygamy. You don't divorce. You have polygamy. I didn't know what you was talking about polygamy. Okay. 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 So he, he has his first wife and his second wife. He comes to church and he's being taught, hey, this is wrong. So he sets aside the second wife or pays her financially or whatever. He becomes saved. Oh, yeah. Is he and his wife then allowed to Yes, of course. Okay. And they're applauded for it. Oh no! You 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 you, you really changed the subject there. <laughs> okay. That that was totally different. Okay. Yeah. Um. Uh, the implication. So so you want to know an answer to that I one? No, like no, to. no. You 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 explain to the person that this is not your wife or husband in the sight of God. But and the first one has gone off and remarried. They can't go back to that husband, but they now are they they now are fulfilling a male understanding of this husband. I don't. No, not if they remarry. No, because you're right back with somebody else's wife or husband. So the second person they're married to now has never been married before, and they both have history. 
But you were married before. I've never been married. No, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about your illustration here. Okay. That person was married, you said, right. and the, the companion is still living, even if they but got divorced. They, they Christians, it does, Christians has nothing to do with it. Marriage is for all. No, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Right. This is old argument. You know, we've heard it a million times, so let me explain it to you as we go along. Yeah, well, we were just trying to say we guys are teaching it the way those guys did in the Bible. So it's not just us conceiving of something. We, we can explain it scripturally and hold to it strongly. Um, marriage is honorable, uh, Hebrew writer. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. So marriage is not just for Christians. Marriage is, God honors marriage as an institution. He ordained marriage as an institution. Not just for Christians, but for anybody. And so the whole world has generally, especially the Western world, has grown up with that understanding. So everybody believes that. That marriage is honored by God, <coughs> whether the mayor does it, the captain on the ship, a preacher, or ever, however the mediation is to make that happen, we all believe that makes a marriage. I mean, you, what organization were you with as a missionary? I was raised independent family Baptist. Well, most I independent. Don't, I, don't, I don't think so. Yeah. Most independent fundamental Baptists believe that, what we're saying. And, and they practiced it. Because it's universal. So, uh, my daughter, uh, let me, I'll give you another example. Do what? Would you recommend that they support such a, for such a marriage? Well, we usually say that's up to you, but this is the truth of the matter. You can't join the church unless that happens. And it's up to you. But, but that's what the Bible teaches. So we don't say you need to go get a divorce. But we say, but, it, but it's just by implication. If you can't join the church, we're saying something's wrong with your salvation. Hello? If you can't join the church, then something's not right with your salvation. It means that um, the, re the only reason you couldn't join the church is you're refusing to live by the teachings of Christ. So if you're refusing to live by the teachings of Christ, then that goes to your salvation. What the church has nothing to do with at that point. So, in, in other words, they can't have faith. no, didn't say that at all. I just said it. It implicates their salvation. It says, uh, you know, that uh, salvation is something that you carried through and doesn't culminate till the end. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. You're born again right now, just like that. You're born again like that, but you're not saved until you obey God and live out and walk in the light to the best of your ability until you die. But who said that she should be saved? That it says they were saved, but it says as many as what? Yeah, were being saved is the correct verbiage translation there. So, um, and everybody that's going to be saved is eligible for the church. Okay, say it again. So woman marries husband. They both divorce and remarry. She marries him. It's his first marriage. They now get saved, and you you he counsel, you counsel them that they need to be divorced. They they're not their marriage isn't you know sanctified or whatever the word is, and so they divorce, and she's now allowed to join the church. It's his first marriage. Is she allowed to have the divorce and marriage to join the church? No, he's in fornication.
Oh yeah, okay. I endorse that. <laughs> okay. Like I said, marriage is a mystery. <laughs> uh, it is a deep mystery in God. The parameters of it is laid out explicitly clear. Uh, it's just... a. All the confusion out there, and you try to bring it in to like here, and you you go through the same thing over and over and over with everybody because they have the same same exact question. Uh, what about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? Well, it's simple. Your marriage, and you get married until death do you part. Very simple. Yeah, but what if? Yeah, what if? What? What if? What if? What if? Uh, that's a sacred principle. You, gotta, you, got, you stand on it. When you, you take a covenant and you're making that kind of commitment. And sometimes all that you have left in a marriage is a commitment. And you're honoring God in this institution. Let me give you one more. Well, we blew this class, didn't we? We got... Do what? <laughs> oh. Uh, yeah, we... Uh, we've got to find another mystery tomorrow. <laughs> um, my daughter, I just want to complete this. My daughter backslid, lost, went away from the Lord, and got involved with another person. It wound up, which 90% of the time, that's what the divorce is over. And, uh, you know, I'm going to finish this class out on this. How much time we got? Okay, I'm just going to do 10 more minutes of this thing. So my, my daughter had <coughs> and was going to get married, and uh, she said, Now, Dad, I know how you stand. You're not going to marry us, but you are coming to my wedding, aren't you? I said, No, I am not coming to your wedding. I said, Because a wedding is supposed to be a joyful occasion, and we're supposed to be happy and cheerful, and, and um, I won't be. And I said, besides that, you don't want me there. Because when the preacher says, does anyone here know of any reason they should not be married, I'm going to stand up. And that's when she decided she didn't want me to be there either. But she, she never had talked back to me in her whole life. And she said, Dad, what about forgiveness? What about forgiveness, Dad? <coughs> I said, what about forgiveness? Why don't you forgive your husband? Why don't your husband allow you to be forgiven? Uh, I said, what do you want? What, what does forgiveness, this is the sneaky language here. What about forgiveness? Meaning, won't God change his institution? How can me forgiving you change the institution of marriage? Are you following me? It's a divine institution. It doesn't matter. She was, she was married, uh, backslid. You wasn't listening to me. You had questions going through your mind. <laughs> she was married, backslid, along come a spider, another guy, and that, no, she was getting ready to be married again. He had never been married before. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I said, well, I said that. She was married, backslid. So, uh, but people want you to change the institution. That's what, what about forgiveness? They're saying, why don't God change, or you change the institution that God made? And we don't have the right to do that. Now, let me tell you about the hypocrisy of not only our former fellowship in this regard, but for all the others out there. They know there's only one scripture they use 
Only one. One scripture. Matthew chapter 5, verse 32, and also 19 and 9. Except it be for fornication. I won't get into their misunderstanding there of fornication because it's translated. I'm sure in your Bible it's translated immorality. And fornication has a specialized meaning. It's usually a sex act, illicit sex act by a single person. The old Webster Dictionary defines it exactly that way. Illicit sex by a single person. The what? Yeah. Illicit sex by a single person. And um, I said even the old Webster's Dictionary interpreted that way. America interpreted that way. The Western world interpreted that way. Divorce, the flood of divorce and remarriage is a relatively new thing in the whole Western world. It's about 100 years old. And it just keeps crumbling and crumbling and crumbling. And people want, because it keeps crumbling, want us to compromise with it. Well, we're God's church. You can't do it. You can't be the pillar and ground of the truth and change the teachings of God. So let me tell you what the hypocrisy of this is. They say, oh, what about uh, Matthew 5.32? Uh, Except it be for fornication. Then they leap from that. By opening the door for divorce and remarriage on that basis, and then go to anything. So if your husband uh, uh, abuses you, meaning uh, he hit me today. Well, I'm cert certainly not encouraging any man hitting a woman. But uh, that's no cause for divorce and remarriage. Uh, well, my husband slapped me. Well... She can't cook. And you go on down the line with all these excuses. Who is that doctor famous on the radio of marriage and counseling and all? Huh? Dobson. Brother, Brother Dobson come up with the three A's. Can't find the three A's in the Bible. But his three A's are adultery, abuse, and abandonment. There's nothing you can't fit under those three categories. So you're just throwing the door open to anything. What do you call abandonment? He's been gone almost a month. He's been gone six weeks. He abandoned me. Did he do that to you? Well, I don't blame you for going and getting with somebody else. I feel sorry for whoever got her. Uh, so you can't do abandonment, you can't do abuse. You don't have to live with abuser, but you can't undo the marriage. That's handled in uh, Second Corinth 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, if you leave your husband or your wife, if they're an unbeliever, they do things like that to you. Uh, the brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. And then go on and read a few more verses. But remain unmarried or be reconciled to your own wife or your own husband. And I want to put it in. We, we got you? Okay. <laughs> Take it back to Port, uh, Costa Rica. <clears throat> so, uh, th that you know, that's the hypocrisy. It's just they use Matthew 5.32 just to open the door to doing anything they want with marriage until there's no marriage left, no sacredness, no holiness, no glory in it. It's just a makeshift arrangement for most people, marriage. Makeshift arrangement. Any? Yes, Brother Trevor.
the, the institution is still standing. <coughs> That's why you have to respect marriage as an in, a divine institution. Well, people don't even have uh, the faintest idea about divine institutions anymore. Brother uh, Anton, Brother Burnett, are you teaching that, uh, the sacraments? You're no doubt going to get into that. <coughs> so you're going to get the whole thing again. Right. You know, there's been some extreme cases following through with what you're saying. Been in some extreme cases. People are so perverted and stupid and messed up. Uh, they, if your husband be dead, then you're free. So they kill him. I don't endorse that. Technically yeah. true, but I don't Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, that has happened. That has happened. And that's where, that's where you go. With that, <coughs> is what? Yeah, it's rampant in Africa. Yeah, yeah. That's how. If you if you um, don't stay with the holiness of this institution, that's where it goes. Mm -hmm. And so you can't compromise it. Well, we have compassion on people, and every church I've ever had uh, pastored, I would usually have five, six, seven, eight people, double married, and they would stay and worship, and we would minister to them, and they would hear the word of God, and I was glad for them to come. So, uh, because God has to, A.J. Tomlinson said, take them under the care of the church till God could work it out. So if they're sincere, and they're saved in double marriage, which is very possible that you can get saved in that condition, but you can get saved in a lot of conditions, but you don't stay in that condition. Let me give you an, a simple principle. If you steal somebody's horse, and then later on you get saved, who keeps the horse? You give it back. Um, I think the first time I said that was an old donkey. <laughs> <coughs> so <laughs> it's time up. I'm over. Oh, I'm sorry, Sister Wanda. No, that goes, that goes back almost to the beginning. You can find traces of it in the church fathers. Yeah. <coughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely.
Yeah. But if you get if you get illicit passions for Anne Boleyn, you'll change the whole world to get what you want. <coughs> I got other languages I use for that, but not on. Oh, well, Martin Luther did get married in secret, yeah. Yeah. He had that story wrong. You got Martin Luther wrong there. But, but he was a monk, but he sneaked and got married. <laughs> you see, people have been sneaking off getting married for I don't know how long. All right, it's over. God bless you. Have a good life.